whether it is our natural curiosity or it is our fear or if it is our sense of longing to know where we will spend eternity. Many of us have the desire to understand what will happen to us when we die. A desire that should be a priority in our lives. But tragically, the fact is that many people do not know or they do not seem to care to know the answer to that question. But it's essential that we know the answer because our eternity will depend upon that answer. In addition to that, the enemy of our soul has confused many people and he has blinded their eyes to the truth with his lies. So they are calmly and casually and confidently on their way to an eternity separated from God. And they don't even know it. And while there are many things that we do not know or understand about the future, still, the Bible is clear on this. We need Jesus Christ in order to spend an eternity in heaven. And as we come to Psalm 24, the psalmist gives us a glimpse, a glimpse of the future. He gives us a, a glimpse of that future day, a day that may not be as far away as some people might think. At the end of seven years of catastrophic, cataclysmic judgment upon the people of this earth, Jesus Christ will return to earth. And it says in Zechariah chapter 14 that he will descend upon the Mount of Olives, a little less than two miles east of the city of Jerusalem, and he will defeat the enemies of God. And as we begin Psalm 24, the Lord Jesus Christ begins his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. And as he approaches the city, an announcement is made. A cry goes out, and it resonates throughout the whole world, where it says in verse 1, Man lives on this earth, but the earth does not belong to him. It is the Lord's possession. It all belongs to him. Why? Because it says he created the earth and the fullness of all that it contains, the world, tevel in Hebrew, everything, everywhere that people live. And those who dwell in it are part of his creation. But the fact is that those that he has created to love him, to serve him, to obey him, have rebelled against him. We may think that we make the rules for our lives and that we answer to no one, but we are his creation. We answer to him. As we are told in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, where it says that even an ox or a donkey knows its master. But in our spiritual blindness, we do not know our master. In our rebellion against him, we do not want to submit to God. Even though we are reminded in verse 2 that he is the Lord of all things, 
because he he is the one who has founded all things, Yasad in Hebrew. He has set everything firmly in place upon the seas. And he has established all things, Kun in Hebrew. He has made it firm and reliable, all things upon the river. So, Jesus Christ has the divine right. He has the divine authority to rule and to reign on this earth. Because he is the one who has gathered the waters together and made the dry land appear. He's the one who keeps the oceans in their place so that they don't overflow and submerge the land and destroy everyone in it. He's the one who formed the rivers on the surface of the land in order to provide water for his creation. So we should not be surprised that he will return and take back his creation. And verse 3 presents us with some important questions for us to consider. Where will we be when he returns? Where will you be? Question in verse 3 is this. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? And enter into the holy city with the Messiah? And who may stand before him, bow before him in his holy place, in his kingdom, in the glory of heaven? These are questions that many people have considered over the years, and they've attempted to answer those questions. But these are questions that we need to answer for ourselves. So in verse 4, we're given the requirements for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. We are told we must have clean hands, nahi in Hebrew. We must be guiltless. The one whose actions, whose behavior, whose conduct is righteous and pure. The one whose Motives are honest and sincere and without corruption of any kind. And we must have a pure heart, it says, bare in Hebrew. The one who's innocent in his heart, in his mind, and in his desires. The one who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, shav in Hebrew, to deceit, to vanity, to the emptiness, to the worthlessness of this world. And who has not sworn deceitfully, shaveh in Hebrew. Who has not made empty promises which he has not fulfilled. This is the one we're told in verse 5, who will receive the blessing, berakah, the gift, the gift of eternal life from the Lord, and righteousness, sedekah, justice and vindication from the God of our salvation. But if we're honest with ourselves, Many of us are not feeling very good about ourselves right now, are we? Because we we must admit, we fall far short of these requirements. Which is why we need a Savior. Which is why we need Jesus Christ, who has met all of the requirements of a holy God. Who has taken our failures, our sins, upon himself, so by his grace, by the sacrifice of himself, we are forgiven. Our debt has been paid in full by him. So then we are able 
to enter into the kingdom of heaven with him. We're vindicated by him. We are made right by him. And our godly character is the evidence of his character in us. This is the generation, it says in verse 6. Dor in Hebrew. This is the dwelling place of those who truly, who fervently seek him, who diligently seek your face, Lord, even Jacob, even Israel. So at the end of verse 6, it says, Sele in Hebrew. Pause for a moment and think about these things. Only those who come to Christ for salvation will ascend the hill of the Lord the hill of Zion, and enter into the city of Jerusalem with him. Only those who come to Christ will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So in verse 7, the cry goes out to the watchmen at the gates of the city of Jerusalem. And we who know Christ say to him, Lift up your head, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And in verse 8, the watchman answers us, and he says, Who is the King of glory? That's a question that many people have asked over the years, isn't it? And we who know Christ respond to him, and we say, The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, a warrior who is mighty in battle, he is the king of glory. And so we say again, Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. In verse 10, the watchman asks again, Who is this king of glory? And so we say, The Lord of hosts, the Lord of the conflict, who has won the victory over sin and over Satan and over the grave. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is the triumphant king of glory and of honor and of majesty. Just look at his nail-pierced hands. Look at his nail-pierced feet. That will be quite a day, won't it? But if you have never come to Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, it will not be your day. Now is the time. This is the day for your salvation. Cry out to him for forgiveness before it is too late. And he will come and he will enter into your heart forever. As it says in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And so this psalm ends with the word sele. Pause for a moment. And seriously, carefully, think about all of these things. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.